United Church of Christ, we're so glad that you're here to worship with us this morning on a beautiful spring day when we finally got some decent weather. It's kind of lovely to have, and we're so glad that you're choosing to spend a little bit of that day uh, with us this morning. A special warm welcome to our guests today. We would ask that you and everyone else uh, take a look at the fellowship pad found on the inside aisle of your pew. Take a moment to uh, let us know that you're here. And particularly if you're new, if you'd put your email address in, we would love to send you our weekly newsletter that shares with you information about things going on at church. We won't send you anything else, I promise. Uh, for those of you on Zoom, please type your prayer concerns in the chat so that we'll be able to share them later in the service. Just a few announcements, a reminder that next Sunday, immediately following worship, we will have a congregational meeting with one item on the agenda, that is to vote to call Sue as our associate pastor. So the meeting will be very short, but it will be important that you're here in person or on Zoom to cast your vote for that decision. For anyone who's been around uh, MHC UCC for a few years, you remember when we had the great bike giveaway. I think that was back in 2015. We set out to collect 50 bikes for the refugee, refugee children from the Congo, and then we found we didn't have enough, and we collected another 25 more. Well, if we could collect 75 bikes a few years ago, I wonder how many we might collect this year. Because our friends at Joseph House, one of our newer ministry partners, are looking for bikes again for refugee children. They're collecting them through May 19th. So if you have a bike that you're no longer using or you're driving by and see someone with one up for sale or on the curb because they're just giving up and giving it away or there's a garage sale in your neighborhood, take a look. And if you could uh, pick up a bike and donate it, we would be so appreciative. Our friends with Allies for Justice are planning our next gathering, which will be on Thursday, May 19th. And this is going to be a really special opportunity. It will begin at six o'clock with dinner here in Fellowship Hall, and then we'll continue with a speaker from Greater Cleveland Congregations who will share with us ways that we can get involved and make the most of our membership in GCC. Uh, there'll be a second, uh, part of that on another Thursday. I want to say June 2nd, but don't quote me. Look at your good news. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Phyllis knows. June 2nd. <laughs> uh, so please plan to join us on Thursday the 19th for that. We are coming up to our graduate recognition Sunday on June 12th. If you have someone who is graduating this year from high school, from college, from graduate school, please be sure to let us know so that we can include them in our celebration. And I believe that Jack Canaris has an announcement, but I don't see Jack. <laughs> he was just in my office checking in with me. Um, we're going to come back to Jack because I don't know where he is. <laughs> All right. Um, we are flexible in the, this worship service. Here he comes. Calling on Jack Canaris to make an announcement. He's a star now, you know, he wants to make an entrance. I think that's it. Our theater, our theater student. Oh, it's Jack and his posse. I love it. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. So this morning, we all just wanted, the youth group, we all wanted to say a big thank you to George and Sandy Yule for helping us with the teeter-totter marathon for 46 years. Mrs. Yule founded it as a youth group leader, and together they have kept this project going by setting up and taking down the teeter-totter, riding and fixing the teeter-totter, and collecting and counting money. It is not just a fundraising event for our congregation and our community, but a tradition that spans generations. It has taught me, countless, it has taught me and countless others the value of giving back to our communi community and how that service is a priority in our lives as members here. Mr. and Mrs. Yule have volunteered countless hours to the teeter-totter marathon, and we are very grateful beyond words for the example that they've set. Thank you. And please stick around for the children's message today, this morning, folks.
as we gather our hearts together for a time of holy worship, we continue to explore our money story that we're focusing on this month as we listen to the new narrative that God is speaking into the limited one that we have built for ourselves. This week we practice release, releasing the shame, anxiety, guilt, or greed that we may feel that prevents us from fully living into God's story. In Matthew's report of the rich young man whom Jesus tells to give up his possessions, we might recognize our own pain when we consider giving up our possessions and wealth in order to follow Jesus. Of what would we have to let go in order to recognize that Jesus is speaking through these tough words for us? Please rise in body or in spirit for this call to worship. Through Moses, God said, In scripture, the law declares, With grace, Jesus said, With honesty, Jesus taught. Faith has always involved letting go, releasing, setting free, dropping our nets, 
giving to others, and following. Amen. Our opening hymn, Take My Gifts. Please be seated. Today we are practicing release. Release literally means to relieve from something that confines, burdens, or oppresses. When it comes to money, many of us long to release shame, fear, or past harm. Maybe we need to release what is holding us back from trusting in God wholeheartedly. Using your washable markers that you will find in the basket at the end of your pew and the coffee filters that you see there, during the service I invite you to write all over those coffee filters in all kinds of colors words and drawings and doodles that represent things of which you want to let go. Now, it's going to mean you're going to have to share, which is something we're going to be talking about this morning. So you want to use several colors. So share those markers back and forth. I'm sorry, I didn't put hand sanitizer in to sanitize them. So if you don't feel comfortable, just choose one and don't share. That's okay. We live in a new age. It's hard to get used to. Um, but continue to color those. You're going to color all over it. And then in a few minutes, Jim's going to demonstrate what you're going to do after worship. We're going to take those coffee filters, dip them into water, because these are washable markers, and the color's going to run all over. And then we're going to use them to make beautiful coffee filter flowers that are going to go on the mandala that we're creating as part of this worship series. So you have till the end of the worship service to keep coloring. And the more colorful you make this, the better your flowers are going to look. And you want your flower to be the star of the mandala, right? So color away. Use words and figures and drawings that represent the things for which you uh, seek forgiveness. You can start now and keep going throughout the service. During these words of forgiveness, as I said, Jim is going to dip and show us what that's going to look like. Because God's renewing grace and enabling the colors in your coffee filter to run and create that beautiful design. So let's now willingly embrace that which we believe is true. For we can come to the seat of grace, bringing our prayers of confession to the one who is filled to overflowing with mercy and hope. Please join me as we pray together. Gracious God, we admit to holding tight to that which we know and understand. 
We put you in a box to avoid the shades of gray that come with faith. We put worship in a box to avoid the discomfort of change. We put ourselves in boxes labeled with gender expectations and societal norms. We put all that we have in a box and pray that we won't run out. We confess to holding tight to fear, greed, and worldly structures. Forgive us for missing the point. Open our eyes to a new way, to a holiness found in open boxes, unclenched fists, shades of gray, and holy release. Open us to the colorful world of grace and mercy. With gratitude, we pray. Amen. Hear this good news. Because God loves us, we lack for nothing. Because God forgives us, we have everything we need. Because God loves us and surrounds us with brothers and sisters, we never have to journey alone. Committing everything to God, trusting in the one who redeems us, we decide to live as God's faithful and forgiven people. Ta-da. God washes away all sin blurring our prayers into beauty and color and grace. Thanks be to God who makes us new. Over and over and over Over again, again. in Jesus Christ we are forgiven. Amen. Will you please rise as we join together in singing our praise response. It's so good to have kids up here. So often lately, you all have been in Sunday school. I'm glad you're all here. Good morning. Morning. Hey, Grace. How are you? Hi, Hannah. Hi, Jack. So, good morning. What is your name, sweetheart? Can you say it again for me? Evely? It's nice to have you. I love your beautiful dress. Thank you for coming up and joining us. How old are you? About three, maybe? Four. Oh, my goodness, you're so beautiful. So I want to ask you this morning, has anyone ever had to give anything away? What have you given away, Natalie? Oh, can't think. What have you given away, Sky? Old stuffed animals and clothes. Yeah, anybody else? What have you given away, sweetie? A cot? Oh, okay. Oh, wonderful. Hannah, what have you given away? Clothes, yeah? Clothes? Everyone's given away clothes, I'll bet. Maybe books? Have you given away some old books? Was it hard to give away things? Sometimes? 
How many had to give away toys? Did your parents ever say, it's time to get rid of those toys? Was that a little harder, maybe? No, not hard to give away your toys? No? One time, what was really hard? It was probably a car, right? No? <laughs> it's hard sometimes to give our things away, isn't it? So where do you think those things that you gave away are now? You think someone's enjoying them? Yeah, that makes you feel a little bit better, huh? Knowing somebody's getting some use and some enjoyment out of what you had. So I brought this backpack today. I wanted to be ready for going to school. So it's kind of heavy. Who wants to try to pick it up for me? Go ahead. You might take both of your books. Don't hold it again. See what I'm doing? Is it really? I feel bad for you. Can you lift it, Hannah? Oh. All right, Hannah had to read it, and it didn't come out. Good job. Anybody else want to try to pick it up? Here you go. You have some more Hannah over here. Don't get me to move it. Zach can do it. Okay. Zach Strong. We got that message, huh? <laughs> so I put enough stuff in it, I think. So what do you think? I brought an umbrella just in case it rains, because, you know, this is Cleveland. I know the sun's out now, but you never know what's going to happen. And then I brought... A dust buster, because you know what? I just hate when the classroom's messy. So I brought this thing that, you know, we can turn it on and suck up any little bits and stuff like that. You know, get your shoes. And so I brought that. And then after lunch, I usually get kind of tired. So I brought a blanket and my sock monkey so I can take a little nap and cuddle up, you know. And then I brought, hmm, I brought a rock because. School of Rock is one of my more favorite movies, and I thought, if I like School of Rock, I should have a rock at school, right? So I brought my rock. And then since it's school, I brought my chemistry book. It's kind of heavy all by itself because there's a lot to learn in chemistry. And I brought some other school supplies, a notepad, a ruler so I can smack kids' knuckles. And <laughs> I brought, oh, let's see what else is in here. Oh, some markers and some post-its, because you always have to take a few notes, and scissors. And then, oh, I get thirsty, so I brought my can of soda to keep me awake, because that's got some caffeine, too. When those teachers get boring in the afternoon, you need a little pick-me-up. But it was kind of heavy to lift up. So do you think I really need all that? No. No, you don't think so? But I probably need my sock monkey at school, don't you think? No. Okay, sock monkey. My, chemis my chemistry book? Okay, we need the chemistry book. Let's, can you help me put that back in there, Grace? There we go. My soda? Yeah, oh, I like you, yes. <laughs> yeah, you think so? Are, are you allowed to drink soda in school? Because when I was in school, you couldn't drink it. I thought maybe I could get away, but how about the dust buster? No? What if the room's kind of messy, though, you know? No? Okay, that's a teacher's job. There you go. Okay, how about this stuff? My post-it? Yeah, that's good. Markers? Okay, cool. If anyone needs any more markers in your pew, I got a few up here. Um, ruler? Yep, I might have to measure things and I might have to smack those knuckles, huh? Stapler? Okay, that's cool. You don't have a stapler? The teacher. I'm old enough to be a teacher. I probably need it, right? A notepad to take some notes? Okay, that's good. Um, scissors? Okay, just have to be careful with those, huh? And what about my umbrella? Do you think I should have that? That's, that's a mixed bag. Keep it in my locker, but not in my backpack. Okay, fair enough. All right. Now, who lifted this up before? What do you think? Rock. Oh, the rock. Oh, gosh, I set that back. I need the rock? Do you think? Why do you think I need the rock, Hannah? Why do you, you just like that rock? Yeah, I do too. But I probably don't need it in school, huh? Although school of rock, I don't know. What do you think? Jack Black would say I need it. Okay, so Hannah, you pick it up this time, see how it feels. Is it a little bit better now that we got rid of some stuff? I'm trying to get this so we could close it, but go ahead, Hannah, give it a whirl. Is that a little bit better? Yeah, what do you think? Is it better than your backpack? Is it lighter than your backpack? Zach, you want to try it? I could actually hand it to you now. It's manageable. I don't know, though, guys, that's still heavy. I hope you put both of your straps on your backpack so you don't hurt your backs. Y'all are going to get old like me, and then you're going to not be able to stand up straight. Those backpacks are so heavy. So I'm doing, oh, I forgot about my blanket. Should I have my blanket? <laughs> I like you. I like you. I have my soda and my black. Thank you. Pardon me? I need my blanket? <laughs> 
So in our Bible story today, there really is a purpose to all of this, because in the story, this young man comes to Jesus, and he says, what can I do to have a better life? He says, I have followed all the rules, but I know that there's something missing. And Jesus says, you have too much stuff. You're too attached to all your things, and so you've forgotten how to share. Has that ever happened to you that you get so much stuff you kind of forget to share? I think it happens to all of us sometimes, doesn't it? So Jesus wanted him to practice release. And I want you to practice release with me right now. So I want you to clench your fists really tight. And now I want you to hold your breath while I count to 10. Everybody get a big breath so you can hold it. Okay, ready? And let it out. And let your fists go. Does that feel better? Doesn't it feel nice when you just release all of that? And that's what happens when we let go of having too many things. We let go of the tension and the fear and the feelings of being overburdened. And that allows us to breathe easier and to be more relaxed and to have more space in our lives so that we can experience God's presence in all of that empty space we've created. That, my friends, is a gift. So next time your parents say, time to clean things out in your room, your closet, or your toy closet, do it, because you'll feel better. Let's pray. Can you repeat after me? Dear God, thank you for the gift of being able to give. Help us practice release. Amen. Thank you, everybody, for being here. Let us pray. Gracious God, we release our hearts to you. First, we remove the pressure, for release requires the freedom to be moved. Then we allow our hearts to return to their original resting position in sync with you, with the rhythm of summer cicadas and this whole wild creation. Next, we pray that you will find our hearts available not just physically, but emotionally and spiritually. Like the mockingbird releases her song, we release our hearts to you. Move in them, stir us awake, speak to us now. We are waiting. Amen. The book of Deuteronomy contains a review of the law of Moses offered before the Israelites entered the promised land. This passage is part of a larger section that tells us how we are to show our love for God and keep God's commandments. These verses addressing the forgiveness of debts and generosity. Listen to this section of the review of the Mosaic Law, reading from Deuteronomy 15. At the end of the, at the end of every seventh year, cancel all debts. This is the procedure. Everyone who has lent money to a neighbor writes it off. You must not press your neighbor or his brother for payment. All debts are canceled, God says so. You may collect payment from foreigners, but whatever you have lent to your fellow Israelite, you must write off. There must be no poor people among you because God is going to bless you lavishly in this land that God, your God, is giving you as an inheritance your very own land. But only if you listen obediently to the voice of God, your God, diligently observing every commandment that I command you today. Oh yes, God, your God, will bless you just as he promised. You will, you will lend to many nations, but don't borrow from any. You'll rule over many nations, but none will rule over you. When you happen on someone who's in trouble or needs help among your people with whom you live in this land that God, your God, is giving you, don't look the other way pretending you don't see them. 
Don't keep a tight grip on your purse. No. Look at him. Open your purse. Lend whatever and as much as he needs. Don't count the cost. Don't listen to that selfish voice saying, it's almost the seventh year, the year of all debts are canceled, and turn aside and leave your needy neighbor in the lurch, refusing to help him. He'll call God's attention to you and your blatant sin. Give freely and spontaneously. Don't have a stingy heart. The way you handle matters like this triggers God, your God's blessing in everything you do, all of your work and ventures. There are always going to be poor and needy people among you. So I command you, always be generous. Open purse and hands. Give to your neighbors in trouble, your poor and hurting neighbors. This is the word of God. And our gospel reading this morning takes place while Jesus is traveling with his disciples toward Jerusalem. He stops often along the way to teach them and those around them, and at times like this, his message can be quite challenging. This section in Matthew follows Jesus' teachings about divorce, and as we hear today, this story is more about the main character, the rich young man, more than he can bear. Listen to Jesus' challenging words from this 19th chapter of Matthew's Gospel. Then someone came to him and said, Teacher, what good deed must I do to have eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Why do you ask me about what is good? There is only one who is good. If you wish to enter into life, keep the commandments. The man said to him, Which ones? And Jesus said, You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, honor your father and mother, also you shall love your neighbor as yourself. The young man said to him, I have kept all of these, what do I still lack? And Jesus said to him, if you wish to be perfect, go, sell your possessions and give the money to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and then come follow me. And when the young man heard this word, he went away grieving, for he had many possessions. God is still speaking. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of each of our hearts be acceptable to you this day, O God, our rock and our redeemer. You know, friends, I think this may be the scariest text in the entire Bible. We spend all the time we hear it trying to figure out how Jesus is not speaking to us. Maybe it's just an allegory. Because Jesus can't possibly expect us to give away everything, can he? I mean, I'm not rich. I'm not powerful. I'm not even a man, so Jesus isn't talking to me, right? I don't know about you, but I hear this text and I just freeze, terrified that I've been found out and that I now have to grieve all the plans that I've made for my perfect life. Jesus gives a series of verbs in a very specific order, go, sell, give, receive, and follow. The rich young man only got the first one, go, and then he chose to leave. And how many times do we decide to leave right along with him rather than walk away because we can't manage, rather we walk away because we can't manage Bible passages that challenge our comfortable, middle-class lifestyles. But what if Jesus isn't talking about material things? What if he doesn't actually want us to live as ascetics? Rather, he wants us to recognize that we are utterly and completely dependent on God's love 
and God's grace. That by giving away all of our possessions, we can truly live by our faith in God in solidarity with our neighbors, which would be kind of like having treasure in heaven, wouldn't it? So what do we need to let go of in order to do this? What do we need to release? When we think about it, it starts to get hard, doesn't it? Because maybe we're just a little too scared or selfish or insecure, or maybe we're too competitive or too controlling or judgmental to want to let go of things. I mean, we've worked really hard to get where we are, and we don't want to give it up now, do we? We want to have a choice of where we go and what we spend our money on, and we want to do what we want to do. But maybe, just maybe, that's exactly what Jesus was getting at. Our wealth and our possessions can mask our dependence on God. It can make us think that we don't need one another. As Jesus is calling that rich young man, he may be calling him back into relationship with his neighbor for benefit to the neighbor, but also to the young man himself. One of the most powerful worship services I ever attended was at Mars Hill Church in Grand Rapids, probably in 2009 or 2010, right in the heart of the Great Recession. And you know, Michigan was hit really hard at that time. And so that morning, the pastors put some buckets out on the chancel. And they said, if you have some extra money in your pocket this morning, come on up and put it in the bucket. And if you are struggling, come up and take some out. Well, initially, everyone just sat there kind of stunned. No one moved. What do you mean, come and put money in and take money out? No one did a thing. But then after a few minutes, a a couple people came forward, and they they dropped some dollars in the buckets. You couldn't tell what denominations, but there was money falling into them. And the pastors just kept encouraging everybody, come forward if you want come and give what you can, but if you've lost your job or if you're short on money for groceries, you can't pay the rent this month, or maybe you just haven't been able to go out and have fun and you want to take your kids to the movie this afternoon, come and take some out of the bucket. People started coming forward. They came forward and they put money in and they took money out, and pretty soon there were hugs going on up at the front and there were tears. People were able to be vulnerable. They were able to share with one another. Lives were being transformed immediately in front of us. It was incredibly powerful. But the power wasn't just in the generosity of the people there. We also saw that people were willing to admit when they needed help. They were willing to help one another and come together. So we're called not only to be generous, but to be vulnerable and open. I think this may be the power of this series. It gives us a way to think about generosity and stewardship by considering our money stories, by finding out how they've shaped us early in life and what influences us even today. And then we can begin to rework them, to become more generous more able to follow in Jesus' teaching. If you haven't picked up one of these study guides that are in the basket out on the table in the parlor, I highly commend this to you. Has anyone started working on this guide yet? I know they almost all disappeared last week. Take some time. This is really interesting to spend a little time thinking about your own money story. There's one question in this text, however, that wasn't in the guide, but I added it to my own. And that's when the young man asks Jesus, what do I still lack? What do I still lack? I wonder if this question is key to living our best and most generous life. When we figure the answer out, then I think our lives can become more full. But I wonder if for many of us, it's a willingness to be vulnerable, to admit our dependence on God and on one another. 
I wonder if we put some buckets up here on the chancel this morning, how many of you would dare to come forward and take something out? My prayer is that each of us would risk digging into our money story to find that something that we lack and then be willing to be vulnerable and recognize our dependence on God and on every one of each other of us. Because then, my friends, then we receive the treasure of God's grace and God's love. And then, then we can go and follow Jesus as we live as Jesus' disciples. May it be so. Amen. Join with me in this uh, affirmation of faith. We believe that on the first day, God released love and creativity over the void, and that void became mountains and rivers, sunsets and starry, starry nights. Out. We believe God laid down with death and was released from its grip, knowing suffering and freeing us from this fragile life. And we believe God invites us, day in and day out, to release our fears, let go of assumptions, tear down walls, throw open the doors, and walk closer to love. May it be so. Amen. Amen. we are offering an opportunity to hear the stories of each individual, different individuals, about their money story. This morning, we are so grateful that Athena Morisco has agreed to share her story. Athena joined the church in 2017 with her wife, Melissa, when she was pregnant for Henry, and now she's pretty much just known as Henry's mom. Athena teaches English at Tri-C and is known for her wicked sense of humor. She serves as an usher here and assists whenever she's asked, just like this morning. Thanks, Athena, for sharing with us. Oh, thank you, Vicki. And happy Mother's Day to everyone out there as well. Um, when Sue had first asked if I'd be interested in presenting today, I joked with her that I was going to come up like, dressed like a giant cash symbol or like a giant dollar bill. Um, but obviously, I haven't taken that route today. <laughs> Um, I always like to set my timer here to make sure that I stay on pace here. So if you see me looking down, I'm just making sure that I stay on course. I'm not checking text messages or anything. So thinking about release, when I first found out that that was going to be uh, the focus for today's money story, um, I sat down and was kind of, you know, reflecting on some points in my life. And I was asking, you know, Melissa for her input as, input as well. And there were really, you know, two points in my adult life where money and release uh, were really prevalent. And they were two unique points. And the first one was 10 years ago, and is actually 10 years ago today, um, May 8th, 2012, when I was diagnosed with a rare type of leukemia. And the second one was a far happier moment <laughs> when we uh, had our son Henry and um, Melissa and I became uh, parents for the first time. And sticking with the first one, um, when I was going through my treatments and there were, you know, various uh, medications I was on and I had to be in the hospital for a month and a half, then plus outpatient, and one of the medicines that I had to be on, we found out was going to be $1,600 a month, and that was with my good insurance. Um, so obviously, if anybody's been through any type of a medical crisis, you know, you're focused on making sure you get better. And to have that, you know, kind of thrown in the mix with how expensive the medication was going to be, obviously it was a big stressor. Um, I had money saved, but didn't anticipate, you know, for it being that much, and plus the other hospital bills that were mounting up. And Melissa had told me, you know, as in the hospital, she's like, you know, don't worry, the money will come. And, you know, it's easy to say, but it's kind of hard to wrap your mind around that. 
uh, we were fortunate. We had so many wonderful friends and family uh, who had some fundraisers for us, uh, who had gifted us with donations, and it was just this you know, beautiful outpouring. Uh, and we were actually very fortunate that we were able to work with a uh, pharmacy and get uh, a um, three-month supply for a lot cheaper. Um, but the money that was given to us, it was kind of this whole circle of giving that we had some of those funds built up that we were able to give those back to some of our friends and family who were dealing with some medical crisis. So it was kind of nice to have that point where it's not our cash to give, it's somebody else's and we were able to kind of spread that goodness on to everybody else. So it was that release from that idea of, of money that we were fortunate to have. Um, a second point when we had our son Henry, um, you know, I think for anyone, they want to do what's best for their child, and they want to give them amazing experiences. And social media is wonderful. You know, it's, it's fantastic with being able to keep tabs on people and to uh, you know, kind of celebrate their accomplishments. But it can be overwhelming at times, and especially if you see folks taking these elaborate trips and these materialistic goods that they're able to, to give and these experiences they're able to have. And sometimes it can you know, be a little daunting. And um, one of the things that happened that kind of shifted perspective on that was when COVID hit. Obviously, horrible and challenging times for everybody and still is, but it made us take a step back and realize the simplistic nature that life can have. Um, it wasn't about having that firm hold on what, what I can buy and what experiences we can share and how much money to put into it, but it was that release that you can have those points in life where it is just kind of appreciating what's around you, like going to the metro parks, taking a walk, uh, you know, doing a scavenger hunt, nature scavenger hunt in the backyard, finding household goods to, you know, create these crafts with. And I have to laugh with the flowers because we have done that with Henry and the, <laughs> the coffee filters. And just seeing, you know, the experiences he's having and the joy, you don't need to have this, money doesn't need to have this firm hold on you to have these you know, really elaborate uh, experiences. And we're hoping to, to, you know, bestow that idea upon Henry as he gets older and, you know, has relationships and, you know, forges those, those meaningful connections. So those were just two things that, you know, definitely, you know, struck a chord with me and hopefully um, you guys are able to connect with that in some way. Thank you.
I'm so grateful for the gifts that you all share with us each week that put us into such a peaceful place. We come to this moment in our service each week where we have an opportunity to share our joys and concerns with others in our faith community so that we can be praying with and for one another throughout the week. Do you have such things to share this day? Ben. Ben shares with us the joy that his sister and brother-in-law are expecting their second child to be born today, and I'm guessing there were no yelling police or anything. It seems like this is a little bit better organized. For those of you who don't remember, Ben shared with us, a, or I shared with, a, with all of you a story about uh, when Teddy was born, how everything happened so quickly, and Ben, who was a police officer, ran into the, into the hospital and pulled out his badge and shell, yelled, police, because it was the middle of COVID and they didn't want to let him in the door. Um, and that's how they got in to get their son born. I love that story. We will be praying for your new uh, nephew, Wes. Happy birthday, Jared. Thanks, Jared, for celebrating this day uh, on, with us in the church and then going to the Southwest Chorus Concert and Mother's Day. It's a busy, busy day, but thank you. Happy birthday. Others? I have a number to, to share with you. Uh, yesterday, we celebrated Connie Lewis's sister's life, Elizabeth uh, Elizabeth. Evans Memorial was yesterday in Ashtabula. There were eight of us from the church who were able to make that trip and support Connie and Bob uh, in that service. So thanks to those of you who came out and celebrated her life with us. Um, we also continue our prayers for Tricia Cardellino following the loss of her mother. You know on Mother's Day when you've just lost your mom, it's a tough day. We are celebrating another couple of joys. They're tentative joys, but we celebrate anyway. This week, we had not one, not two, but three people who finished their rounds of treatment. John Gemba had his last round of chemo on Tuesday, and we'll go for a CAT scan at the end of the month to determine the effect of all of that. It's been a rough road, but he's made it through. Les Thwaites on Tuesday also had his last round of immunotherapy after a year of treatment for his melanoma, and Jan Henninger completed her treatment for cancer as well. So we celebrate the end of that and pray that it all results in good outcomes for all of them. We continue our prayers for uh, Gus Freilich, for uh, Bill Simpson, for Craig uh, Gordon, and for Carl Lawrence as they continue their journeys through health difficulties. And we pray this morning for the Van Zanti family. Dale's mom, Nancy, is in hospice care having just been diagnosed with cancer but is fading very quickly. Luckily, the whole family was able to join her in Iowa this past week and celebrate some time together. We also pray for Dan Adams, who will be undergoing brain surgery on Friday. Dan has not worshiped with us in person since before the pandemic, but you may remember Dan and uh, his wife Karen, who are grandparents of the Dietz children, that's Shelley's mom and dad. Are there any prayer concerns to share from the chat? Um, oh, actually, I could look. Prayers for Eva as she is having um, a procedure done, and for a procedure done tomorrow. And I don't know if I. Wow. Barb Nitsche asks that we celebrate her dad's 96th birthday on Wednesday. He is an amazing man, and we celebrate with you. Anyone else? Okay. Uh, as we end our prayer this morning with the Lord's Prayer, I invite you to continue to celebrate that Pentecost moment as you pray in the language of your choice, whether you're a debts and debtors, a, um, 
sins and sinners, however you choose to pray. I pray to the Father, the God, the Creator, however it works in your own heart. But let's begin our time of prayer in silence as we lift the joys and concerns within our hearts to God. Holy God, who seeks our constant communion and who offers us grace upon grace, we confess that we pray in fits and starts, that at times we feel no need of your help, preferring instead to rely on our own self-sufficiency. At other times, we simply lose heart. We look around and see that the poor are always among us, that justice is yet to roll down like waters, that we have beaten our plowshares into swords, and we wonder, how long must we cry? Help us to recognize our utter dependence on you. May our prayers become unceasing. We pray with those who are crying this day, for the people of Ukraine, Afghanistan, and Iraq, and all who suffer the effects of senseless war, for children who sleep the fitful sleep of hunger, for those who are despondent because they feel unloved, and for those mourning the loss of loved ones. Give us the strength of compassion that we may not shield our eyes and hearts from the pain of our sisters and brothers, but seek instead to understand and to heal. Bless us with courage and fill us with hope that we may help lessen the suffering of our world. On this Mother's Day, we give thanks for those who have nurtured and loved us without condition, those who have shaped us and taught us. May your blessings pour out on those beautiful, strong women of faith who have been mothers to us along the journey. We pray also for those for whom this day brings sorrow, those who grieve the passing of a beloved mother, those who never knew the gift of warm hugs and constant encouragement, but rather abuse and judgment those who ache to hold a baby in their longing arms. May your abiding love and gentle presence fill each this day. And on this particular Mother's Day, we struggle with the possibility that our country is about to take a giant step backwards, that motherhood is being debated and controlled by policy, laws, and court decisions that take away a woman's control over her own body that weaponize and criminalize choices women must make about becoming mothers when a pregnancy isn't viable, when the circumstances for continuing one's life to raising a child aren't feasible. God, grant us wisdom free of judgment, discernment that considers the needs of both the child and the mother, and courage to enable each person to determine your will in their own lives. Today, we join our voices with those throughout the world who seek your guidance in the spoken and silent prayers that come to you from sanctuaries and street corners, from battle lines and prison cells, from hospital rooms and festive tables, with bowed heads or heads held high, standing boldly or kneeling quietly. We pray to you with thanks, with sorrow, with urgency. We ask your guidance and rest in your comfort as we pray these things in the name of the one who taught us to pray together, our creator who art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Jesus has called us to give up our possessions, to recognize our many blessings that we may be better prepared to serve and to help others. This morning, as you give your morning's offering with joy and generosity, 
I'm, I will ask Mars to come up and share with us some of the reasons that he gives, some of the things that he enjoys as benefits of giving in this congregation. Mars? Ushers, please come forward to receive the offering. Good morning. I've been asked to say a few words about our ongoing faith journey classes. The classes have been interesting, sometimes challenging, but always, always a most beneficial motivator for continuing education and understanding what we believe and why we believe it. Most importantly, perhaps, we challenge ourselves to grow in our understanding of God and our place in God's world. In other words, how we are to act and interact in God's world. Classes have effectively motivated us to be in a faith, a faith journey and to not be satisfied with faith stagnation. Since childhood, we've grown and learned in life. Most of us have spent 12, 16, or more years in school to promote our secular growth and, and learning. Yet, many of us are tempted to do little to promote our own Christian growth and learning. It may not be enough to simply maintain our childhood or teenage understanding of who we are in God's world. In the very earliest sessions of our classes, we were reminded that any personal information or stories are to remain in class and that privacy is to be respected. Thus, we are free to express ourselves without fear of being embarrassed by any expressions that might be repeated out of context outside of class. Additional new classmates are always desired, encouraged, and welcomed. The class structure is such that any homework is optional and it's easy to jump in and out as one's time and schedule permit. Having said that, most of us have found the classes to be beneficial and interesting enough to keep us engaged and wanting to not miss many classes. Please do seriously consider joining us either Sunday mornings in room 104 or on Zoom on Monday evenings using the sign-in information in the good news. Or, as a few of us do, both times. Discussions are equally vibrant at both sessions but different because of differing perspectives of different participants. Also, a shout out to both our paid and volunteer leadership. Sue Prey has been instrumental in organizing and often leading us, supplemented by several volunteer leaders. And Ann Over, as chair of the Adult Ed Committee, has been equally instrumental in supporting us and effectively coordinating with that committee. Finally, a shout out to you, whose paid pledges pay Sue's salary and provide the building of space, along with a few class expenses that support our endeavors. We are indeed fortunate to have such capable, dynamic leadership from both Sue and Vicki. Thank you, and please consider trying it out. You might like it.
this morning as you depart, please be sure to step out into the courtyard to dip your coffee filter so that we can create beautiful flowers for our ongoing mandala project. And now as we go into the world, give with intention, welcome with extravagance, and love unconditionally as you are loved. Amen. Go in peace.